What I just saw was out of this world. Wow! Increíble, fantástico, wunderbar, bikurisuruyona. Up, beast of thought. Absolutely phenomenal. Disney just gave us the best episode of the season with a book of Boba Fett, episode five, The Return of the Mandalorian. And all they had to do was upstage the bounty hunter with a jetpack with his own knockoff. Wow. Welcome, Slayer Nation. It's George Mola with another episode of George the Giant Slayer. I hope you're all doing great. Disney finally struck gold with a book of Boba Fett, and all they had to do was give everyone a prelude episode to The Mandalorian Season 3. It doesn't make any sense, sir. Now, I want to not waste any time and jump right into the episode. It was written by Jon Favreau and directed by Mandalorian veteran Bryce Dallas Howard. That's Happy Days, Richie Cunningham's very own daughter. The show was coherent and well-executed, chock full of fun entertainment. However, its shine seems to serve to cast the Book of Boba Fett deeper in the shadows. Yeah, it, it's overwhelming for me. Oh, I was putting all the pieces together. Do you trust them? I trust them to work in their own self-interest. Now, the return of the Mandalorian opens, plunging everyone into a pool of electric blue color in a meatpacking plant. Mando strides into the slaughterhouse with his mercenary edge to collect a bounty. I can bring you in warm, or I can bring you in cold. After he finishes off a pack of Clatoonians with a dark saber, he takes the severed bloody head to his clients. Those men at seeing Din Djarin at his best as a cool bounty hunter and as an amateur using a lightsaber without the skills or scruples of a Jedi to cut a Clatoonian in half, those are moments to relish. The information his clients provided him tell Mando the location of a covert on the space ring world of Glavis. The opening minutes are a visual feast of imagery, engaging action, and a spectacle of bloody, dark, gritty action, a typical of Disney show. But it was a very, very welcome surprise. Now, Din locates the covert and finds the armorer meditating. That's the mother warrior figure from season one and two of The Mandalorian. He also finds another survivor. That's Paz Vizsla. And as soon as Paz sees him, he starts treating Din's wounded leg, which he received from clumsily using the dark saber. Now, Paz is descendant from the house Vizsla. He's also the big Mandalorian in season one of Mando, who provided cover fire for Din and Grogu when they were escaping Navarro. Get out of here. We'll hold them off. You're going to have to relocate the covert. This is the way. This is the way. The next few scenes exemplify some of my favorite attributes of Mandalorians. They do not waste words. Having fulfilled his quest, the armorer takes Mando back into the covert, and she starts to retell him the story, the rich history of the Darksaber and its original wielder. It was forged over a thousand years ago by the Mandalore Tar Vizsla. That is Paz's original ancestor, who was half Mandalorian and half Jedi. She starts to reforge the Beskar spear that Mando handed to her. She tells him, Beskar is primarily used as an armor. It's not to be forged into an offensive weapon that can be a threat to Mandalorians. During this time, she relays to him the cautionary tale of Bo-Katan Kree. Now, Bo-Katan at one time claimed leadership of Mandalore based on her family name. That was a clan that long ago had strayed from the path of the way. And Bo-Katan had been gifted the dark saber. Unfortunately, she's supposed to win it in combat, which triggered a curse, which had said that if you didn't win it in combat, that would lay waste to Mandalore and see all of its people scattered to the four winds. That led to the night of a thousand tears, the montage of Mandalore being decimated by the empire 
is a treat, a spectacle of techno nightmare visuals of flame and blaster fire. The annihilation is highlighted by the evocative score, which frames the carnage by an army of K2SO droids. Din shares with the armor that he wants to check up on his foundling. The audience can feel how much he misses Grogu. She had forged the spear into a gift for Grogu at Din's request, and then she advises him that Jedi forego all attachments, unlike Mandalorian Creed, which stresses loyalty and solidarity. Then we see this incredible, awesome, short, intensive training scene with Din in the Dark Saber. It's great to see a non force sensitive train. The sword is heavy and it's unwieldy in Mando's hands, even as the armor is instructing him that his body may be strong, but his mind is unfocused. And that mere persistence on repeating drills without further internal insight will only continue to result in more failure. But it doesn't matter, because in just a little bit, Paz Vizsla, who feels entitled by birthright and blood to the blade, challenges Din for the dark saber. Their fight takes place on a catwalk, and neither of them are allowed to use their jetpacks. Now, the evocative clank of Beskar on Beskar during the duel makes for the perfect soundtrack to a primal brawl. Din wins. You're good, kid. But as long as I'm around, you're second best. You might as well learn to live with it. Because they find out that he once removed his helmet, he's called an apostate and exiled from the Enclave. To return, he must purify his spirits in the living waters beneath the mines of Mandalore, which were destroyed a long time ago. This is the way. This is the way. The time that Din spends with his kin makes for engaging storytelling. They could have given us this boring information dump. Instead, they relay the Mandalorian history as essential, electric, and in an organic manner. I really enjoyed it. Din Djarin leaves Glavis. He takes off on a communal shuttle for Tatooine. Now, there's this comedic bit that they do, which I thought was completely useless and overdone and actually damages Mando. He had to take all his weapons and gear and store it in a security bin before boarding the ship. Regardless, we see him on the Starliner and we start to feel the loss, the pain he felt for having handed over Grogu to Luke Skywalker as he looks at the Beskar-filled handkerchief the armorer gave him, which she tied and it was like she made it to look exactly like Grogu's head and ears. This is more emotionally moving than anything else we've seen this season in Boba Fett. Mando lands on Tatooine and he goes to his friend Peli Mato and her pit droids. Now Peli is played by none other than Annie Sedaris. Peli has a replacement for his Razor Crest, a Galactic Republic Naboo starfighter. Mando is not impressed. All he wants is his razor crest. And just as he's about to take his credits and leave, she's like, hey, wait a minute. You know, this is pure pre-Empire craftsmanship. This is handmade. No droids touched it. Best of all, it's off the grid. Sold on it, they fix it up and kit it out to make it into a speed demon. This was a solid good scene. It could have been incredible except they kept relying on way, way too much nonsensical humor. So while a gonk droid powers the starfighter, we learn that the citizenry and all law enforcement are completely terrified of the Pike Syndicate. The Naboo starfighter fires up and Din takes her for a wild ride. The engine purrs all the way through Mos Espa and zips and speeds its way through Beggar's Canyon, pushing the envelope all into space. Mando passes the same shuttle that he took to Tatooine and he nods to a Rodian child who's waving through the window before he's stopped by a couple of New Republic X-Wing officers. The first one is Captain Carson Tava, played by Paul Sun Hyun. Now that's the same captain that uh, gave the Republic Medal to Gina Carano's Cara Dune. 
And the next one is Lieutenant Reed. That's played by Max Lloyd-Jones. And that is the actor who was the double for Luke Skywalker in the season two finale of Mandalorian 2. I loved it. They start asking too many questions. Din hits his sublights and disappears. A little while later, he returns and lands in Tatooine. Woo! Well, how was it? Wizard. Fennec Shan shows up and offers Din Djarin a job to be muscle for Boba. He refuses the credits, but takes the job, saying, I gotta pay a visit to a little friend. And that's where the episode ends. I enjoyed it, but it was really bizarre to devote a fifth episode of a new series to a star of another show. I mean, they pulled it off perfectly, except for my one gripe with that ridiculous humor that they laid on way, way, way too thick. Come out, come out wherever you are. <laughs> Dated a jowl for a while. They're quite furry. <laughs> oh, here they are. If I give them a list. You hit this button, you're gonna evacuate your exhaust manifold. If you know what I mean. Those J-type pulse engines really tighten the old evacuation port, don't they? But on a positive note, Pedro Pascal still has that it. He can still relay that um, deadpan wit and his intelligence underneath his helmet. But by this time, they need to start pushing Boba more into being like Mando and to run away from being what he's currently embodying. Because in this entire season, we've only seen the true Boba Fett come out maybe a handful of times. And I think the best version of that was when he saw his face filled with bloodlust when he was hunting down the Nikto Raiders in Slave One. Now. Smash that like button, subscribe, and share with your family, friends, and coworkers, and share it on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all over social media. It's going to help us grow even more. And remember, never bow down, never bend the knee. Firmly defined. Step up, stand tall, and get busy living your best life now. Always forward.